Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 327 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's show is with Dr. Daniel DeSalvo. Now, Dr. DeSalvo is a pediatric diabetes endocrinologist at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas Children's Hospital. He also has type 1 diabetes himself. Now, you know me. Dan came on the show to talk about how Dexcoms were being used in hospitals during the current coronavirus. But then I started talking to him, and I think we got to that part eventually. Just, I enjoyed Dan's conversation, so we didn't, you know, I I don't make a bullet list and be like, talk about this, then this, then this. I don't know how to do that. If you want that, go to another podcast, which I'm betting will be boring. Anyway, this one is interesting and fun, and you'll still learn about how Dexcom is used during the current corona crisis in hospitals. So, you know, all the information gets out. But you're not put to sleep by a boring host and stagnant questions that have been written down on a piece of paper. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. By Touched by Type 1, Dexcom, and Omnipod. Now you can go to ContourNextOne.com right now to find out if you're eligible for an absolutely free meter. And why would you want to do that? Well, one reason is it's absolutely the most reliable and accurate meter that I've used in well over a decade. So that's a pretty good reason to check into it. I'm also going to ask you to check out touchedbytype1.org. In these trying times, organizations that are doing good work for people, they need your help. So check out touchedbytype1.org. And of course, you can get a free no-obligation demo of the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump at myomnipod.com forward slash juicebox. And to check out the people who put these continuous glucose monitors in the hands of the people helping those who are suffering from COVID-19, check out Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. I'm going to read you something here, but first, let me remind you that nothing you'll hear today on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. I'm going to read to you now from Dan's professional statement. It says, Dr. DeSalvo joined the faculty in pediatric diabetes and endocrinology at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital in July of 2015. Previously, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University, where he was an active researcher in diabetes device technology, including closed-loop artificial pancreas systems. His overarching goal is to provide compassionate and comprehensive treatment to children entrusted to his care and to advance the field through clinical research. It says some more here, but what I'm going to tell you is Dan's a serious guy who knows how to have a good time while he's given an interview. And now, Dr. DeSalvo. My name is Daniel DeSalvo. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist at Texas Children's Hospital, and I'm on faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I have been a pediatric endocrinologist for, I guess, about seven years now. And my inspiration started when I was 19 years old as a sophomore at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And it was through that personal journey and a desire to help others that I sort of had this epiphany about halfway through my sophomore year where I realized I wanted to become a doctor for kids with diabetes, not realizing the journey that that would lie ahead. I switched over to pre-med and never looked back. And here we are uh, 20 years later after my diabetes diagnosis. And now I have the incredible joy and privilege of being a pediatric endocrinologist where I can walk with and shepherd families on a diabetes journey. And I feel like I learn as much from them as they probably do for me. Um, and you know, I'm really glad to talk to you, Scott, because a lot of my patients actually listen to your podcast, read your blogs, and have really found a lot of inspiration, hope, practical kind of tips and tricks, and also community. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, diagnosed in college, what were you thinking of majoring in before you made the switch? 
so I was actually a, a political science major, and I was thinking that I maybe wanted to go to law school. Mm-hmm. Didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And um, really, it was through my, my diabetes diagnosis uh, that, that sort of led to this, as I called it, an epiphany. Um, my best friend or one of my best friends growing up was Eric Pasley, who I think has been on your show before. So Eric Pasley is a country music singer now. But growing up, he was just a good friend of mine who had type 1 diabetes. And uh, so I learned a little bit about diabetes from Eric, um, but really had no idea that that would be what I would want to do with my own life until my, my personal diagnosis. Isn't that kind of a funny side story is that I had, I had for a moment, I thought maybe I wanted to go into medicine. And when I was a senior in high school, there was an internship where I spent about a week in a pediatrician's office. And at the end of the week, I decided, you know what? Medicine is just not for me. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, through my personal journey, I've decided to go on this path and I cannot be more grateful for the opportunities that it's provided me in terms of being able to edify my own knowledge, but mostly just be able to, to, to through um, my clinical practice, pass that on to others. And also as a clinical researcher, help to really, um, advance the field of, of diabetes. Before I ask my, my big question, um, was type one, a surprise? Like, were there people in your family who had it or did it come out of nowhere? Scott, it was a total surprise. I, you know, I was that kid who never missed a day of school. I always won the awards for, for attendance. Um, no family history of type one that we're aware of in my family, some type two, um, but no family history of type one. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I, that the summer after my freshman year of college, I went on a medical mission trip to Africa. Actually, it was a, just a mission trip, not a medical mission trip, but a mission trip to Africa. And on the tail end of that, got really sick. And uh, when I came back, was just continuing to lose weight, had excessive thirst and urination. This similar story to, to so many who've, who've been diagnosed with diabetes, but was kind of in denial. And finally, it was my roommate, who was a really light sleeper, who every time I woke up was waking up and finally said, Dan, I don't know what's going on, but you've got to go find out what's going, you know, what's wrong with you. So I went to the uh, student health center at Baylor and was diagnosed with diabetes and uh, spent a couple of days kind of learning how to manage diabetes, had a, a sister who was in college about two hours up the road in Dallas, who actually came down to, to Baylor where I was and um, such an amazing advocate would actually come to my classes with me. Um, because she was so worried about me, you know, having a low blood sugar. This was all brand new for us mm-hmm. and would help me kind of talk to my professors about this new diagnosis and what to expect. Okay. So having advocates like my sister, Sarah, was was really impactful. And it wasn't long before I became my own self-advocate and developed my own knowledge base. But, you know, to answer your question, this was totally out of the blue. And while initially shocking, really led to you know, learning so much, building community with other people at cam- on campus who had diabetes, and ultimately leading to this sort of career um, calling for me. So what would you, how would you describe your, your goals for patients? Um, I mean, we talk all the time here. It's interesting. The, it threw me off a little bit by saying that you knew the podcast, but, you know, we talk all the time here about giving people great tools good information so that they can make better decisions so they don't get caught sort of in the the backsliding vortex that is being confused by diabetes. And and I hear back from a lot of clinicians who are like keep talking about this please this is how we do it. You know, we share the podcast with people um but I hear back from far more people who have successes after listening go back to their doctors and then are honestly yelled at like scolded in the office, um, even when they show data, even when they pull out a Dexcom graph and say, look, no, I, d- I don't have meaningful lows. You know, I, I've only been under 65, 2% of the time, you know, in this 90 day period, I'm, I'm getting this A1C, you know, legitimately the doctors, you know, what I always surmise is either they don't understand or they're just scared and they've never seen anybody with a good A1C before or someone make a change that quickly. And and that does happen. People will listen, and in the span of one A1C measurement, sometimes drop their their number a point, or or some people too. And it scares. Is that what's happening to them? Can you can you kind of put yourself in those shoes? You see somebody with an eight nine who all of a sudden has a six nine, and they tell you, "I 
heard this on a podcast. What, what would that sound like to you as a doctor if somebody came in and said that? Yeah, so a couple of things on that, Scott. First of all, you asked about sort of my my personal mission for caring for patients, and it's really to empower them to live well and thrive with their diabetes, to really take ownership of it. And I'm not only looking for improved clinical outcomes, but also less burden of diabetes. And I think part of that is is being really tied into community and having a sense of purpose. And I think that's where the Diabetes Online community, your blog, your podcast has really helped to inspire them. I also think it's those nuggets of truth in terms of uh, being able to have the self-initiation to manage diabetes, having the confidence and the skill set that comes with time. Mm. And I think hearing other stories, what you've done with Arden, what so many of the parents you brought on, um, what so many of the young adults uh, living with diabetes, their stories, I think, has really helped in, helping to empower others. You know, I, I think my sense as a you said at the at the onset, an early, a younger physician. Um, you know, I'll kind of take the the how I view this for maybe some of my really amazing experience silver haired colleagues. I think where, where from where they stand is that the diabetes control and complications trial was published in 1992. Yeah, and at that time, you know, what really was in many ways now the stone ages of diabetes, having a lower A1C was associated with a higher risk of having a severe hypoglycemic event, having a seizure, loss of consciousness, passing out. Right. To be clear, with the tools, the technologies that we have now, that is no longer the case. In fact, if you look at the T1D exchange data, which is sort of a cross-sectional look at A1Cs in the U.S., having a lower A1C is not associated with a higher hypoglycemic risk. Yeah. In fact, um, those with the highest A1Cs have a higher risk for having severe hypo, probably because in many ways they're managing their diabetes in the dark. Maybe they have a lot of struggles with, um, you know, maybe their adherence and sort of where they are in their diabetes journey it could be from a tough place. Maybe it's the social determinants of health that don't allow them to have access to technologies that, that others may have. But, um, you know, what I've heard on your podcast, what I've certainly experienced in my, cl in my clinical practice is that so many families who have A1Cs that are dropping, 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 at the same time having less hypoglycemia on their CGM. That's sort of the holy grail of diabetes, right? Yeah. There's, I think, three things. One, a lower average glucose associated with a lower A1C. Two, more time and range, the percent of IUs in the 70 to 180 range or 70 to 140. And then three, less hypoglycemia, percentage of values below 70 or below 54. And that can be achieved, that can be done, with a dynamic approach to, di to diabetes, with the uh, technologies and skill sets and the self-initiation. So in my personal practice, um, you know, my goal is really to help, help to lift up and inspire my patients and their families, and really to be sort of, in many ways, a coach and a guide. My hope is, is that they'll reach the point where they're just as uh, self-empowered and, and self-initiated as you and Arden are. And I do see that with so many of my patients. And it is a journey. Um, everybody's on a different pace of that journey. And for some, they require a little bit more guidance and coaching, but they do often reach that sort of Zen state in diabetes where they've got it and they've got the confidence to do it. And they reach a place where it's less burdensome. And it's just so amazing to see the kids living well and thriving as students, as athletes, as musicians without diabetes getting in the way. I, I honestly, the feedback, you know, I've been doing this now for quite some time. And what I'm seeing coming back from people is that it doesn't really matter your level of education or social status or, or any of the ways we, you know, quote unquote, measure people. Everyone can figure this out. And it's not as difficult as we make it seem or, you know, as, as others sometimes make it seem. I'm not saying that taking care of diabetes is simple. I'm just saying that there are some basic kind of tenets. If you follow them uh, through experience truths are, you know, unearthed and all of a sudden you see them and then it doesn't matter the situation. I always kind of chuckle sometimes when people are like, Hey, what you talk about on the podcast, would that work during a soccer game too? And I was like, it works during everything. It, it's, it's the idea of putting insulin where it's needed. It really is all it's about. I, I joke all the time. If you all figure it out, I'm not going to have a podcast anymore. It's timing and amount, put the right amount of insulin at the right place. That's it. it I mean, there's not much more to that. There's other variables of course, that can impact those things. But you start to experience those variables. And then before you know it, 
when something goes wrong, you just know what to do. I, I don't know another way to put it. Like when something happens with Arden's blood sugar, I don't stop, put my hands on my hips and start thinking, oh, okay, well, you know, I guess so she was outside extra. I just, I can, I look at that graph on that Dexcom screen. I think for a brief second about what's going on and I know what to do next. And that just comes with repetition. You just have to get your 10,000 hours. And once you have them, it's, I hate saying this, but it's kind of easy at some point and easy, not that it's not impactful and horrible and, you know, all the other things that diabetes is, it's just your time involved in it becomes so much lesser that it's sort of just a throwaway to me. Like it, we don't really talk about diabetes around here that often, you know, it's just something happens. We adjust, we keep moving. We don't look back. Um, I don't know why that can't be. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to rephrase. I believe that can be taught to anyone. But I think it's the same thing. I think the reason the podcast works is because of the repetition, the conversations around the ideas, because it's not something you can just sit and tell somebody, you know, one time how to do and write them down a rule, which is, you know, everybody wants, you know, tell me when, tell me how much that's, that's not how this works. So, um, given that I believe you believe, you believe in that too, my thought on this end always is if I can do it here, right? Like if you've ever, you've never heard me speak live somewhere, but I guarantee you, I can talk for an hour, an hour and 30 minutes and a large percentage of the people in that room will leave and their A1Cs will go down by a point in a month. So what if I can do that, because Dr. Dr. Can I call you Dr. Dan? Dr. Dan, I'm almost a moron, sure, just absolutely. so you know, like an idiot. I, I No college, barely got through high school. Okay. Um, if I can do this, why can those, even those silver haired doctors, why can't they like, or, or anybody like, why is every, why are, why are there a mass of people just going with, you didn't die today. And that's a good day. Like, why is that the, why is that the bar we're trying to get over? Yeah. So, so, you know, one is, is I think, I think you're exactly right that your life experiences and sort of learning from cause and effect is something that can really help to inform the next way you do it, right? Mm-hmm. So um, using CGM as what I call a heuristic learning tool, meaning something where you can sort of learn from cause and effect. Yeah. So with the, the breakfast that you eat or the activity that you, that you do or the, you know, your favorite meal at your favorite restaurant, once, you know, God willing, we can all go back to doing that again, um, you know, really paying attention to it and, and the approach that you took with your insulin, the timing, um, how it was delivered, um, you know, the, the, the adjustments you make with your temp basils or the, the, the carbs that you take before exercise, um, make, taking mental notes of that and the next time trying to do it just a little bit better yeah. and, a re- and eventually reach that sweet spot where you can do it really well. You know, one of the joys I have is to be able to sort of watch families as they progress through, that, through this process. And you probably remember it well from when Arden was first diagnosed when she was a little one and how daunting that was and how you wonder how you can ever do this. Um, and then you start to gain a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more skill. And you eventually reach that, that, that sweet spot where you realize I've got this and I can do this and I can um, really become a, a, an expert. I think with the physicians, I, you know, uh, I think there, there are so many also who are nimble and who do change sure. and who were here during DCCT way back in the early nineties or before, and who really have advanced to, to, to where, you know, we are now with leveraging technologies and taking a dynamic approach to diabetes. I think the nature of medicine, though, is, is that there are others who may be a little bit less resistant to, to change. They're still practicing the way that they were trained. Um, and I think the other thing is, is, as providers, we can all have the humility to sort of learn from our patients as well. You know, maybe there's a new tip or trick that they've learned. And if we kind of step back and learn from that, it might be something that we can help to impart to another family as well. Um, in the case of diabetes. And so I think that's, I think that's just a, a matter of being, um, you know, willing to sort of change, to have an open mind, to really advance one's knowledge and to be able to um, take the learnings from others. And, you know, if it makes sense to help to, you know, realizing that everyone is different, mm-hmm. to be able to help to, to take those special um, tips or tricks or pearls so that others can can use those to uh, improve their diabetes, improve their quality of life as well. Yeah. Well, I I just listen. I 
I agree with what you're saying. I I would like to put myself out of business here. I joke with, you know, after I put my th- kids through college, but I would like to put myself out of business. I would like it that one day this is how doctors across the globe talk to people about diabetes. And I, I've had private conversations with some who will say, well, you know, there are some people who don't get it. And I'm just thinking, I always think, no, you just, there's a way to explain it to them. You, you know, I, I, I fall back to a conversation I had a long time ago on the phone with someone, someone online connected me with this young mother uh, and she was struggling helping her daughter. And I got on the phone with her and I was like, oh, I can help her. And I started talking and it it became kind of evident to me that I was speaking with uh, someone who had to drop out of high school to have a baby and that maybe wasn't on track to go to college to begin with. If that, that, you know, I'm trying to be kind. Um, And, and she just wasn't the, she wasn't the brightest person I'd ever spoken to in my life. And I was explaining uh, pre-bolusing to her the way I explained it to everybody forever. And she just wasn't grasping it. And in that moment, I had this horrible kind of dire feeling like I have to get off the phone. I can't help her. I'm going to put her in a situation where she's going to hurt this kid and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I stopped and I thought, how am I going to do that? How am I going to just tell her, oh, well, good health isn't for your daughter and, and get off the phone? And so in that moment, I made up a story about a tug of war and I put insulin on one side of the rope and carbs and body function on the other. And I started telling a story about this tug of war. And now I sometimes get notes from people who say, Hey, I was in an office the other day and my doctor explained pre to me. And I said, do you listen to the juice box podcast? And the doctor said, yes. And I thought that's just such a wonderful thing, but it's because I didn't Listen, I'm not trying to give myself credit. I'm trying to say that if you can't give up on people, that everybody has the ability to understand this. This is it's it's not that difficult to understand. You just have to find the words that they need. And I think that, you know, Jenny and I were talking the other day on the podcast and I said that sometimes, you know, it's not that we're bad students. Sometimes you're not a good teacher. And and you know that that, that should be it. And I, I get the rest of it, man. Like I get the office hours, and you got to get people in, and you got to get them out, and there's this minimum amount of time. Like I can't imagine that. That seems like a horror to me. But I don't think this is um, I don't think this is how we're going to end up helping people with diabetes. I, I um, you know, 15 minutes at a time every three months. I think that the conversations are where it happens. Um, and 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 I think they can get it. I think everybody can get it at some point. I just am very excited about the idea that you heard about the podcast and that you've apparently listened to it. Um, that's really cool. I, I, I appreciate that it's made it out like that to people. Um, it's very uh, it, it's very encouraging when someone sends a note and says, hey, I went in with my A1C. I showed my doctor my graph. He looked at the graph and said uh, quietly, they always whisper for some reason, do you listen to the Juice Box podcast? It looks like you do by your graph. Like, that's weird, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, I it throws me. It it's gives amazing. me chills. Yeah. It gives me chills, you know? Um, sure. But anyway, I, I just think that people like you being out there, I find it very encouraging. I really think this concept of talking to people like they can understand um, should just be commonplace. Anyway. Um, I agree. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I, w- one of my favorite parts about my job is that I get to interact with such an amazingly diverse group of people from so many different backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds, race, ethnic backgrounds, education, socioeconomic status. And I think you're right, Scott. I think everybody can get it. I think it, it, it might take a different approach and really meeting people where they are. But if we take the time, the effort, the energy to do that, then, they, they, then we can get there. I mean, everyone, um, you know, all, all these parents, they, they love their kids. They want their kids to be healthy and safe and to thrive. And if we take the time as a team to, to, to teach them how to do that, it's helpful. I think something that you hit the, the, the nail on the head with is, is that it can't all happen in the walls of a hospital. So finding community, um, and whether that's online or with, with the podcast or, um, you know, we have a lot of different community groups at our hospital to, to get families together. I think there can be shared learning there that can really help with others so that Again, we can transport this knowledge. We're not just keeping it with one family, but we can really share it am- among others. I think it's also helpful for the for, for the providers, for the diabetes care team to, to, to be there as well. Mm-hmm. Because again, we learn so many tips and tricks um, around diabetes management, around how to use which adhesive to keep the CGM on or 
or the pods or, you know, how they, you know, whether it's pre-bolusing or managing diabetes and exercise. I think we all have a lot of learning there. And, and that, again, that knowledge can be transported to the masses. Being agile like that is so, it's incredibly important. If this, like you said, if we're ever allowed to travel again, I'm supposed to head out west to talk to a group of doctors about how I talk to people about diabetes. And that's that's a cool thing because those are a group of people who are going to leave their ego behind, get in a room, and, you know, stupid me is going to walk in and say, look, here's what I've learned about how people hear this. And that's, that's very, very exciting to me um, because, you know, listen, uh, I, I have friends who are doctors and one of them told me once he, he put an age on it and he said, I'll never go to a doctor over that age. He's like, because they just stop learning. And, you know, now all of a sudden you're being, you know, you're being treated 25 years ago and that's, you know, not valuable for people. And I'm like, wow. So everything we, you know, but there are uh, plenty of doctors who are older that keep up too. And that's just, I don't know, man. Absolutely. Yes. In in fact, I mean, a lot of my mentors, so people like Bruce Buckingham at Stanford, who I trained under Mm -hmm. people like Lori LaFell at Joslin, Bill Tamberlin at Yale, who've been doing this for a long time are not only incredible mentors, but they are, um, you know, at the cutting edge of of diabetes. And um, there's so many who, you know, might be, you know, might, might have started this journey a little bit before me, but are way advanced in their knowledge and constantly have that agility to change and, and are really at the cutting edge of this. And so, yes, I mean, they, that, that's, I, I wanted to specifically call out a few of those who've had such an impact for me and my training and, and, my, and mentoring me in my career. But there are so many people like that who are out there. Yeah, it, it can't get lost. We're talking about the problem where, you know, but it can't be lost in the conversation. There are plenty of people who stay behind. You know what I mean? They learn this thing and then they don't run forward and keep it for themselves. They stay behind to share it with somebody else. And that's how the idea grows, yeah, it, you know? Uh, uh, yeah. And I think that that gets back to being one's advocate as a, as a patient, as a parent, where um, if you have an interaction with a, a, a diabetes provider where you don't feel like you, you're learning, where, where you don't feel like they're supporting the, um, what you're doing and, and, and managing diabetes when you know it's working, there are others out there too. And, and I, I don't think it's always an age thing. I think it's partly just a, a, an openness and um, being really a, a adept at um, taking cutting edge approach to diabetes care, a dynamic approach with pre bolusing and, um, you know, dosing based on trend arrows and leveraging uh, technologies like CGM and closed loop systems. Um, you know, that, that's who you want to learn from. That's who you want to be um, in your corner, so to speak. And yeah. so, if you don't feel like you're getting that, then you know there, there are others out there. Hopefully, depending on where you live, who can can who who, who can be of more support to you. I just want to be a cheerleader for organizations who are out in front and thinking in a modern way. And for the rest of them, who through fear or whatever the reason is that they keep good information from people, you know, shame on them. You know, I just I don't have any time for it. Uh, okay, Dan, we had you on for a reason. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't this, although I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. If you have type one diabetes, you need a blood glucose meter. Even if you're using the Dexcom G6 or another CGM, you still need a reliable and accurate meter. that's easy to transport and use. And that meter for me is the contour next one blood glucose meter. Now, there are links right here today in your show notes, right in the podcast player, or you can go to juiceboxpodcast.com to find them. But what I'd like you to do is to go to contournextone.com and check out the meter. I mean, I know it's a blood glucose meter, and you're thinking, what could it possibly do, Scott? You put a test strip in it, you poke your finger. I mean, they all do that. Yeah, they all do it, but some of them do it better. So right out of the gate, the Contour Next One accuracy is insane. Top of the level, right at the top, right there, right there, the pinnacle of the mountain. If you picture a mountain and up the side of the mountain, there's different blood glucose meters in order of how great they are. Contour next one, right at the peak. I think you understand. It's good because of my amazing description. Now, test strips offer a second chance, which means if you hit the blood and don't get it right, you can go back in, try again without ruining a test strip. It's got a great light that works at night. It's small and easy to hold on to without being so small or slippery, you know what I mean? 
that you can't handle it. I just love it. Absolutely 100% the best meter I've ever used. Contournext1.com. Check out the link at the top of the page. You might be eligible for a free meter. When you're done there, please check out touchedbytype1.org. Wonderful people doing amazing work for people living with type 1 diabetes. They need you now more than ever. Touchedbytype1.org. And of course, if you'd like to check out the Dexcom G6, dexcom.com forward slash juice box, and to get a free no obligation demo of the Omnipod tubeless insulin pump, go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. All these links are in the show notes of your podcast player or at juiceboxpodcast.com. You know, I, I was talking to Dexcom and they were uh, discussing with me a little bit about how the sensors are being used during the current coronavirus crisis. And I found that idea enchanting and I wanted to know a little more about it. And they said you were the one I should talk to. Um, so can you tell me how CGMs are helping during this time? Absolutely. So, you know, I think the main reason why CGMs why the FDA is allowing CGMs to be used during this unprecedented time with the public health crisis of COVID-19 is that it came out of the need to really preserve personal protective equipment or PPE, Mm -hmm. and also to reduce the frequency of staff exposure with COVID-19 positive patients. So you can imagine without CGM, if someone with diabetes who also is COVID-19 positive, you have to have pretty frequent blood glucose checks. And every time there's a blood glucose check, The staff is having to don PPE, to wear PPE, to walk into the room, to check a glucose. That's another, that's staff exposure to the the person with with COVID-19. And and, and furthermore, you know, of course, with with blood glucose, it's just snapshots in time of what the blood sugar is doing as well, as, as opposed to CGM, which really is the full comprehensive picture also with the trends and the alerts. And so in step CGM with this ability to have this cloud-based technology where if the, the person with diabetes who has COVID-19 is using CGM with the Dexcom G6 system, the transmitter can transmit up to 20 feet. But also if it's on a cell phone, which Dexcom is supplying Android phones um, for the, the user to have, the, 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 the patient who's hospitalized. Oh. Via the Dexcom share a follow feature, those CGM data can be tracked remotely by the healthcare team so that the, so that the nurse who's no longer at the bedside can receive an alert for a low or a high glucose on her phone or, or her hospital issued device so that the, the doctors, the medical assistants, whomever are part of that care team mm. can receive those timely alerts. And also, depending on hospital protocols, you could use CGM in some cases, to supplement or even in place of a normally scheduled blood sugar, depending on where that that level is. So again, you're reducing the need for PPE, you're reducing the staff exposure to patients, but you also have this this real-time CGM, which can aid in glucose management and medical decision-making. So that's where it came, was really out of the the need to to limit PPE and uh, staff exposure with patients. But I think that there will be a lot of lessons learned on how CGM as a tool can really help with keeping one safe and healthy during hospitalization um, for for someone with diabetes. That's the second thing I thought when you were saying this. The first thing is I wondered what the process was like. And, you know, I guess the the FDA had to say yes to this in a in a quick fashion, I guess that that is interesting. But I'll I'll bug Kevin about that when I get him on. Um, But the idea that all of a sudden nurses and doctors are going to get to see this technology that they maybe don't know about. And I know it's easy to think, of course they do. They're doctors. They live in hospitals. You know, this is, this is their life. But Arden had a cyst removed. It was, you know, just a little cyst. It was a, it was a short surgery she had to have a, a number of months ago and, you know, had all the conversations in the world with the surgeon. This is what Arden wears. We'd like it to stay on her while she's in there. Doctor was like, oh, yeah, sure, sure. I got yes to death. That's no problem. I get to the hospital on the day of. The nurse comes in the room to prep her. The prep nurse is like, oh, yeah, that's no problem. If the doctor said it was okay, it's fine. Well, then the nurse, the next nurse comes in, the one who's going to be in the procedure. And I start, you know, now at this point, I've said it to the doctor. I've said it to the prep nurse. Everyone's yes me to death for a month about this. 
So I'm now I'm just talking to the the third nurse and I say, uh, hey, you know, this is great that you guys are doing this. She goes, oh, that's not hospital protocol. We can't do that. Just like that. I was like, wait, what? No, no. I've been talking to the doctor and I started explaining it to her, showing it to her. And she's like, yeah, it's great, but we can't use that. Another nurse walks in the room and I just, I wish you could have seen me down. I pivoted right from the one nurse to the other one. Like the first one wasn't there anymore. I was like, hi. And I started explaining again, thinking like, let me take another stab at making this clear to somebody. Well, that nurse says, oh, my friend has type 1 diabetes. That's cool. Let me see. Oh, she has this too. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll use this. I'll keep her phone with me. Just like that. The tiniest bit of understanding went made that conversation go from, oh, no, there's a hospital policy. We can't do that. To, yeah, no problem. Give me your daughter's phone. I'll take it into the operating room with me. And that's the understanding that this kind of technology needs throughout the medical community because a podcast shouldn't be one of the main ways that people find out about Dexcom. Like, why the hell does that have to be the case? Do you know what I mean? Like, and by the way, don't, don't get me wrong, Dan, I need my ads. Okay. But, um, but I, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, is that this should be something people just think of, not something that they're scared of or say, oh, I don't know about this. So this is a great, this is a great opportunity for them to see it live fire and, and really um, help spread the word to other people with type one. Uh, because until it's thought of like that, you're still going to run into situations where insurance companies say stupid things like your A1C is too low for a CGM, as if those two things in any way have anything to do with each other. Um, you're going to get me upset, Dan. I, I, I want people to have Dexcoms. So um, uh, so that that is that is very cool. So what you're saying to me is now um, we're keeping – we're saving equipment. We're saving exposure and probably giving people, I would think, greater care than they were going to receive the other way. I've seen friends in the hospital with type 1, and it, it doesn't normally go very smoothly. Have you ever been in the hospital and been hospitalized with your diabetes and had the experience of having to manage like that? No, but you know, there was Adam Brown from Diatribe wrote a really, really interesting piece on this, his experience uh, in the hospital as someone with diabetes. I've seen it. And you know, you're right. It, 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 it can, it can be, there can be some challenges there. Um, you know, that, that's one of the things that Dexcom is doing here is since Dexcom has, or CGM has not been approved by the FDA for in-hospital use previously, only for in-home use, mm -hmm. there may be less um, knowledge or experience with it. So they're doing, really doing a nice job of, of providing training to those healthcare teams who will be deploying it. Yeah. The other thing that hospitals are doing is looking to who are the experts for example, diabetes educators or maybe the, the diabetologists or their teams to help train the trainer, so to speak, to, to, to help to teach and empower the, the hospital um, staff to, to use these systems and also how to sort of set up and operationalize what that remote monitoring would be like. And then also it requires a little bit of a new protocol, right? So since in many cases, this will be the first time that CGM is being used by those care teams, what do you use for your low and high alerts? And what you use for low and high alerts in a hospital setting may look a little bit different from what it would be at home. Mm -hmm. For example, a hospital might decide that they would use a low alert of maybe 90 or 100 so that they can intervene in a little bit more timely manner or a high alert of something more like 200 or 250. There have been some studies that have looked at um, sort of health outcomes as it relates to blood sugars. And actually in a hospital or especially an ICU setting, having a blood sugar that's more in the 100 to 100 to high 100s range is associated with improved clinical outcomes as opposed to running really tight like you might um, when you're otherwise health and safety, uh, uh, health and safe in your own home. Mm -hmm. And so um, de developing the systems and protocols is something that hospitals are having to do. Uh, we've been talking for a while um, just as a industry about how we really need disruption in healthcare, right? So that we can do things a little bit more um, and a little bit more efficient um, and uh, I think technology forward way. And while COVID-19 has been such just a terrible tragedy for our, for our country, um, the countless lives, lives, lives lost, the impact it's had on our economy, how it's impacted almost every one of us personally in some way or someone we love has been so horrible. You know, one of the, one of the silver linings I think that may emerge is that we will see things like deploying these technologies in a, in a smarter, safer, more efficient way. Um, a move to telehealth where we can, um, you know, instead of having families 
being disrupted from their their normal um, you know job or education, having to deal with traffic, be able to do things by telephone. And in diabetes, where we have cloud-based CGM technology, where families can, in some cases, download their pumps from home or at least provide a log of what their doses have been, um, actually lends itself nicely. So my hope is, is that many of these lessons learned from this really horrible crisis can be used going forward to deliver healthcare, deliver medicine in a much smarter and better way for, for, for patients. It, it, it is normally in emergency times that medicine leaps forward. I, it's, you know, it's hard to think about, but wartime brings all kinds of revolution to medicine because you put doctors in a situation that isn't perfect. You give them, you know, you give them less tools than they may normally have in a hospital. And now all of a sudden they've got to be MacGyver and they figure something out. And some of that stuff ends up, you know, becoming commonplace in, in practice. And I'm just, I don't know, I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm imagining a nurse getting an alarm on a CGM at a hundred, like you're saying, and intervening and then watching the blood sugar bounce back up and having that thought like, wow, maybe I didn't need as much glucose drip as I thought I did here. And, and maybe next time that'll stop them from driving some poor patient's blood sugar to 250 because, you know, because of fear. Maybe you'll, it'll teach the, the fine tuning ideas around diabetes to them, you know, and, and, and then who knows where that goes from there? Like, where do they take that information and where does it spread to next? Like, this is the stuff to me that's macro, very, very exciting for people with diabetes. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen to that that nurse in that, you know, made up situation, goes home, becomes a, you know, the parent of a kid with type 1 diabetes five years from now. And then that kid becomes a doctor like you 20 years from now and blah, blah, blah. And where do we end up because of this? You know, I, I just, I can tell you that where I am now in my understanding of type 1 diabetes was held back by the direction I was getting from my daughter's doctor. I was seeing things and I was having thoughts and, and desires about changing practice, but everything I heard on the doctor's office side was telling me I was wrong. And I had to break out of that feeling that, oh no, I am doing it right. This is just what diabetes is. Um, I don't know, man, like I'm, I'm very excited for people to not live the way, um, some people do now in the way my daughter did for a number of years when she was first diagnosed. I, I just don't think there's a need for it. And I think that anything that moves us towards that is exciting. And this is particularly interesting and in how it came about. Um, do you happen to have any numbers on how many people are actually wearing it, uh, who are infected with COVID-19? Do you know? I do not know how many it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell you I've been hearing from a lot. Dan just disappeared. Hello, this is Dan. I'm back. Dan, what happened? I'm wondering if Zoom kicked this out. I don't know. I sang while I was waiting for you to come back, which I'll take out because I, <laughs> I can't sing. You were saying well, I can pick up with your last question, which yeah. was in regards to how many um, people are using it right now. And I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you from speaking with my colleagues um, from all across the country, we're all eager to use this in our hospitals just because of the reasons we mentioned in terms of being able to preserve PPE, to reduce staff exposure, but also to have that helpful tool for aiding diabetes management. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to your earlier point, one, one of the things that is helpful with CGM, in addition to um, having the comprehensive glucose stream, to having the, the, the alerts, it's having the arrows also. And, and in many cases, this will be the first time that um, some of the hospital staff will see that. So, you know, I always, I always describe uh, glucose as being like a vector or an arrow. It has both a current level, but also direction. Yeah. So a glucose that's 150 and headed down is different from a glucose that's 150 and double arrow up, changed by more than three milligrams per deciliter per minute. And so to be able to kind of, you know, and in and, and the case of daily management, you know, and, and I, leveraging those trend arrows for, um, daily diabetes decisions is so important. And I think that that can play an important role in a hospital setting as well with managing um, insulin doses or insulin drips or IV fluids and dextrose concentrations and so on. So that's another one of the things I think will be born from this um, th this use of real-time CGM during the COVID-19 pandemic. That's a great point. I talk about stopping the arrows. I, 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 I consider not just the, you know, the direction I, I, in the speed, I call it the momentum. I'm like, you have to stop the momentum of the blood sugar. And, you know, 
you know, talking to people about, I don't know, about a pre-bolus idea. I'm like, you know, you, you count your carbs, your blood sugar's 90, you put your insulin in, but you don't pre-bolus. Now, all of a sudden, the food starts impacting your blood sugar before the insulin has a chance to, uh, before you know it, your blood sugar's 180, it's 190, it's 200, it has momentum. You only have enough insulin in there to cover the carbs. If you're, if you're lucky and, you know, the glycemic load of this food actually matches up with your carb ratio that's set in your pump, right? And so now you're staring and watching this, this number go up and up and up. You don't realize you need the insulin for the carbs. You need to be, you need the insulin to stop the momentum and you need the insulin to bring the number back. You know, you're sitting on one third of the insulin now that you need, um, you know, one third of the picture and you, you know, most people stare at it and stare at it and they think, oh, I counted the carbs, right? Like they're back at that point. That's not, that's not even a tiny bit of the picture. Uh, um, it, it's, I couldn't do what I do for my daughter and what she does for herself and what the people listening to the podcast end up doing for themselves without the data that comes back from the Dexcom. Like, it's just, it's no bull, you know, like I, I, there's a lot of people I could have as advertisers on the show. There's a reason I chose the ones that are here. Um, I was wondering about your management. Do you have like, um, like what are your goals day to day for yourself? Yeah. You know, I think for, for me, it's, you know, I, I live a pretty busy active life um, professionally, but also as a father of two young kids. And so, um, certainly for me being able to, to watch my glucose and trend arrows, uh, closely is important. Um, you know, I, I aim for pretty tight control. Um, and so I have pretty tight thresholds on my low and high, you know, that works for me. It may not work for some of my patients, depending on where they are in their diabetes journey. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I pay, I pay pretty really close attention to the trend arrows and a lot of what you're talking about in terms of, um, you know, stopping the glucose in its tracks, looking at the momentum of whether it ties or lows with insulin or carbohydrate, um, respectively, um, and really trying to sort of guide the glucose and, and sort of hone in on, on that, that maintaining the, the, the time and range and the euglycemic range that the range of, you know, for me, I'm aiming for 70 to 140 typically. Yeah. Um, I also, you know, I, I, um, do a bit of, um, you know, nutritional approach to diabetes for me as an adult works, you know, it's, I'm not, I, it's not something I necessarily advocate for my patients, but I tend not to eat breakfast on uh, weekdays. And so I'm able to sort of ride my basal rate usually um, and within range glucose in the morning. And then for lunch, I usually eat a uh, fairly lowish carb lunch and get most of my carbs at dinner. And so I don't have to worry about blood sugar quite as much during the day. And then in the evening time is where I, um, tend to, you know, have my, my largest meal. It's also when I exercise. And so that can present some challenges with management. And so just like the patients I care for, I'm always learning in my own diabetes on how to, how to best manage it. Have you ever taken information from a patient and applied it to your own life? Oh yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, there, there, there are little tips and tricks that I pick up from them that I might use in my own, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, um, sort of a concrete example is, is with uh, the adhesive that I use for my um, Dexcom. You know, I, I run, cycle and swim. I, I, live, I, lead, I lead a pretty active life and I have two kids who like to wrestle with me. So, um, you know, I, for a while I was having a, a, some challenges in keeping it on for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Simpatch, this was a while ago, but Simpatch is an adhesive that's available on Amazon and other places. And it's also hypo hypoallergenic. And so that was something I was able to use to really buttress down the CGM, uh, the sensor and transmitter to prevent it from coming off. And, um, you know, I've really not had any trouble keeping it on for, for 10 days. And I usually wait until it starts to maybe on the edges start to come up just a little bit and then apply the adhesive. Okay. And with that, it's it really works well. And so that's something also for my patients who, you know, they may be athletes or, you know, in Texas, it gets really hot in the summer. People do a lot of swimming. Using these sort of things can be really helpful. So that's just one of many examples I could, I, you know, I, I could share, of, you know, that I've learned from, from patients. Now, I just thought you have, a, you have an interesting, you know, uh, opportunity for yourself. Do you think that having type 1 diabetes is a benefit for you in what you do? Or, or does it give you an advantage? I mean, if I'm looking for a, a, um, an endo, would I... Do I want them to have diabetes? Do you think? You know, I think I think anyone can do this, and I think I think it really takes having um, a passion, but also having the kindness and 
um, just the uh, the willingness to to go the extra mile in terms of having the knowledge um, and skill set and diabetes management. I don't think you have to have diabetes to do that. I do think that living with diabetes does give you a way to really connect in a really powerful and impactful way with patients and families. And so I, I do sometimes, I mean, I do oftentimes share um, that I have diabetes and, and I don't really talk about how I manage my own diabetes as much, mm-hmm. but I do try to convey a message that, again, you can live well and thrive with your diabetes. You can become absolutely anything. You can become a professional athlete, a movie star. You can become a U.S. Supreme Court justice, a lawyer, a doctor, um, really whatever it is that you're passionate about. You know, I used to say there's only two things you can't do. One is become a commercial airline pilot and the other is join the military. Well, the FAA has now now allows with uh, a doctor's um, letter um, the potential for someone to become a commercial airline pilot with diabetes. That is a huge win. Yeah, Um, It hasn't happened yet with... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I had Owen Lieberman on the other uh, week, and he was talking about this. And now I'm starting to see people holding their letters from the FAA uh, all of a sudden in the last couple of days on social media. Uh, So it's happening. People are getting their their pilot's license back, and sometimes for the first time, who have type 1. It's super. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. And and I mean, honestly, that's in no small part to Dexcom as well. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, an ability for someone who doesn't understand diabetes to be given a visual way to understand it and then be able to make that leap. Like, oh, you know, we just, you know, the government just thought people randomly get low. And that's what we were talking about earlier. Doctors 20 years ago were telling you, keep your A1C higher, you know, keep your blood sugar higher. You don't want to randomly get low. And now there's, there's real concrete ways to, to stop that. Listen, last night, last night at, 11.30, Arden's blood sugar started to trend down, and I couldn't figure out why. So we're talking, and I was like, hey, it's holding, but it's like it's at 70. And I'm like, if you look at the line, I don't think it's going to – I don't think it's going to hold up for us. So we started taking basil away to see if we could get it to rise, and it wouldn't rise. So we're talking. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. She, she, she pulls out her period tracker, and there are days prior to her period where her blood sugar just – that she just doesn't require that much insulin. And so, oh, this is where we're at, right? So from 1130 last night, no lie, till three in the morning, I kept Arden's blood sugar up using the Dexcom. And without it, I can't tell you how low I think she would have gotten because I was able to, with confidence, take away the basal insulin in a way that held her up in the 60s, which is, by the way, the best we could do for a couple of hours, even with food intervention and everything else. I'm just trying to imagine if we were blind there, I would just see a low number, I would treat her, and then that, you know, I'd I'd think, oh, it's going to come back up again. But for for four hours last night, Arden's blood sugar just didn't want to come up. And I had the comfort of knowing that that was true and being able to manage her through it. And, you know, eventually, obviously, it it started to move again. And then we were able to re-add the insulin and bolus with confidence. After four and a half hours of not needing any insulin, I was able to look at a a trend and say, whatever that was is over now, and you need your insulin again. And so because we were able to bolus with confidence, she didn't get high, you know, all of a sudden when her body had different needs and she had a, you know, a reasonable um, uh, period of time where she didn't have very much basal insulin. It's just, it's magical, man. Like it, it just is, you know? So I don't know. I love it. Yeah. I think it's essential. I mean, yeah. For people who have busy professional lives, no matter what it is, having that real time data on your phone or on your wrist, to not only know where you are, but where you're headed yeah. so that you can actually, um, you know, as Wayne Gretzky said, it's not enough to know where the puck is. You got to know where it's headed. Yeah. Um, and really think one, two, three steps ahead. I think that that is absolutely essential for being able to do all the things we do to have that that information, that that helpful data. Do you know the genesis of that story with Wayne Gretzky? His father was... I, it was something to do with his dad, right? I, I don't remember the exact details. His dad was teaching him to play, and he always seemed like he was behind the game, and he told his son, you got to skate mm. where the you got to skate where the puck is going, not where it is. And it's just... I, that I, analogy is... Yeah. Yep. So, so, um, you know, perfect for, for diabetes management, right? I tell people all the time, the insulin you're using right now is for later. It's never, it's never for now. Nothing you're doing with your diabetes 
in this moment is for right now. It's always for later. And more importantly, and it's a, a weird distinction that might seem like it's not a distinction, but it is if you really think about it. it. It's not so much the insulin you're using now is for later. It's the insulin you used in the past is for now. And I know that mm. seems like the same thing, but if you really kind of like really go into a wavy gravy place and think about it for a minute, then it's, um, it's different. It's, it's more about, it's about controlling the energy of the insulin, the power of the insulin that's coming at you. It's, it's about, it's about being in that it's, I know it, I don't know, maybe you'll have to wrap your head around it and other people will too when they're listening, but it's not so much about now for later. It's about before for now. And if you can wrap your head around that, yeah. this is kind of easy, you know? Anyway, awesome. uh, Dude, I'm really thrilled you did this. I uh, I didn't expect to have such a great conversation with you. I thought we were going to just be like, hey, COVID-19, Dexcoms, that's cool. And then you'd be gone. But uh, but this turned into a, an excellent episode. And I'm, I'm really excited that we did this. I might have to ask you to come back on again sometime and maybe talk more about your personal uh, story, if that's uh, something you might be interested in. Absolutely. I'd be more than happy to. And Scott, thanks again for the work that you're doing to... You know, advance the cause of people living well and thriving with diabetes for the community you built and for getting this message out, out, out there. Um, you know, again, it's, it's so, uh, I think, important for using uh, real-time CGM in this area of COVID-19. Um, and I think that there will be many lessons learned from this, both in the hospital setting and, and as well as with telehealth that will uh, be propelled forward as we one day re-enter normal life. It's hard to imagine that right now, but we'll all be there. And so, my thoughts and prayers for everybody out there and hope you and your family stay safe well. And I'm adding same to that list because it can be mind numbing sometimes to be stuck at home. But, um, you know, my, my best wishes for, for all your listeners as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Dan. You know, we um, last weekend ended up I staked my entire family and we played poker. I played poker to get my own money back, <laughs> just to just to try to pass the time. I said to my kids, I'm like, here's 25 for you, 25 for you. I gave my wife $25. I took $25. I'm like, all right, this pot's worth 100 bucks. We played for seven and a half hours. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> no one wanted to give the money away. <laughs> yes, we need distractions these days. Absolutely. I saw a woman online uh, say that she spent four hours yesterday watching a truck get towed out of some mud. She said it's the most exciting thing that's happened to her in a, in a month. <laughs> so, uh, all right, man, wash your hands. Stay safe as well. Uh, I really appreciate this. Huge thanks to Dr. DeSalvo for coming on the podcast and sharing his story and telling us more about how the Dexcom G6 is being used in hospitals to aid with the coronavirus fight. Huge thanks also to the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget also sponsors like TouchedByType1.org, Dexcom, and Omnipod. They make the podcast possible. So check them out, use the links, support the show. I'm still here. I'm so bored. I don't know what to do. I mean, once I finish this, I'm just going to go downstairs and like clean something or make something or put something away. It's all my options. Here's my, here's my day. I sleep and then I wake up and take a shower. I work on the podcast, I cook something, clean something, cook something, clean something, take out the recycling cook something, clean something, watch Ozark, and go to bed. That's it. It's the whole thing. It's my life. It's your life. It's our lives. But not for much longer. Hang in there, people. Stay strong. Wash your hands. Cover your cough. You know what I'm saying. Don't be disgusting. See ya.